you're at home and you get a call from Chase regarding your worst nightmare, a fraudulent transaction. Fortunately, Chase is able to reverse the transaction. However, these type of payment uncertainties are an inherent weakness in our current electronic payment systems. Because of these uncertainties, buyers need to routinely give sensitive information like their signatures and card numbers, while sellers are at the risk of losing merchandise to fraudulent transactions. A large amount of trust is demanded from all parties involved. Is there a way to create an electronic payment system that doesn't require the need to trust third parties while simultaneously having the certainties of using physical cash? In his 2008 white paper, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system, Satoshi Nakamoto argues that he has the answer. This is the White Paper Center, brought to you by Randall Richard Raymond. So Nakamoto begins by explaining what transactions are in his electronic cash system. Transactions are the exchange of money between people, but what does electronic money look like? In order to understand that, we need to turn to a couple terms from cryptography, the art of secure communication. The first term is something called a hash. You can think of a hash like a digital fingerprint. Any data on your computer can be hashed or turned into a hash. For example, your Microsoft Word document is data. If you hashed it, you would get a digital fingerprint of it. Change one word in that document and you get an entirely new hash. Hashes or fingerprints allow us to identify data and make sure it hasn't changed. The other term is digital signature. Just like normal signatures, a digital signature is a cryptographic tool that ensures that you and only you authorize sending a message over the internet. So to make a transaction happen in Nakamoto's vision, one person, we'll call them Bob, identifies the virtual address of a person they want to send money to. We'll call them Alice. In order for Bob to send money to Alice's address, he must first prove he has money to send. How do you do that? Well, Bob finds coins sent to his address from a previous transaction. He takes the hash of this previous transaction, as well as the hash of Alice's address, and signs them both together. Through this, Bob has proven that he has the money and that he is authorizing the movement of that money to Alice. But what happens if Bob tries to use that same money and send it to another person, Joe? We call this a double spend. One way to solve this is by introducing a central authority that will watch over each transaction and make sure none are double spends. But remember, Nakamoto wants to solve the electronic payment uncertainty problem without needing to trust third parties. Nakamoto's solution is a system where transactions are publicly announced to a network of independent participants who must agree on a single history of the order of transactions. The first part to Nakamoto's solution is something called a timestamp server. First, imagine that after transactions are publicly announced to the network, they are packaged by network participants into something called a block. This block is then timestamped. The block is hashed and the resulting block and hash are distributed amongst the network participants. This process proves that the block and its corresponding transactions happened at a specified time or else the hash would be entirely different. Each block also includes data for the hash of the previous block. Thus, each block timestamp reinforces the block timestamp that preceded it. With this timestamp server, we can see that it's possible to create a single history where the history is a chain of blocks and each block is a package of transactions. But who decides what block comes next in the history and how? The second part of Nakamoto's solution answers my previous two questions. The block that's appended next to the history happens via a race amongst the network participants called proof of work. In proof of work, network participants compete to solve a cryptographic puzzle. After network participants gather transactions and group them into a block, they must slightly modify the block until they're able to get a hash or digital fingerprint of the block in a certain agreed upon form. The first person to do this gets to send out their block to the rest of the network who then verify the block's validity and add the block to their personal chains. Solving this puzzle requires CPU power, so the more CPU power a network participant has, the more likely they'll be able to win the race and publish their block to the network. 
As a result, the network is secure as long as honest network participants, participants that correctly validate transactions and don't double spend, control the majority of the network CPU power. Putting it all together, the network runs in the following manner. First, new transactions are broadcasted to all participants in the network. Second, each participant collects the transactions and places them in blocks. Third, each network participant attempts to solve the block's cryptographic puzzle. Fourth, the winner of this race broadcasts their block to the network. Fifth, the network verifies that each transaction in the block is valid, so no double spends, and that the block itself is valid. Finally, if the nodes think the block is valid, they'll begin working on the next block and refer to the recently accepted block as the previous block. This entire process builds something called a blockchain within the computers of each network participant. So where do all these network participants come from and why are they motivated to participate? Nakamoto addresses these concerns by introducing two incentives. The first incentive comes when a network participant packages a block together. The participant is allowed to add a special transaction to the block that grants the block creator a certain amount of money. The second incentive comes in the form of transaction fees. Whenever a transaction is broadcasted, it can include a bonus which is granted to the network participant that includes the transaction in a block. Each network participant or node stores on their computer the complete history of all transactions. This means each node has every block saved somewhere on their hard drive. This poses an issue for computer storage space. Nakamoto proposes a scheme that would allow nodes to contain a simplified version of their blockchains. So first, let's revisit a subject, the metadata that's stored within a block that's separate from the list of transactions, such as the timestamp. Nakamoto refers to this metadata as a block header. The block header also includes the previous block's hash. In reality, when we say block hash, we refer to the hash of the block header. Another piece of data in this header is something called a Merkle root. You can think of the Merkle root as a combination of all the hashes of the transactions that the block should contain. After transaction, say transaction A is buried under enough blocks, the transactions that were used to supply transaction A can be pruned from the blockchain. This doesn't break the block header hash because only the Merkle root is stored in the block header. So Nakamoto claims that it's possible for a node to verify that a payment happened without needing the entire blockchain. In fact, the node only needs to have the block headers. In order to make this work, a node would only listen for transactions in the network that it cares about. Once it hears of one, it'll make sure the transaction's hash fits within the Merkle root of the appropriate block. Nakamoto argues that this technique is reasonable as long as the network doesn't have a lot of dishonest nodes. Nakamoto notes that transactions can reference multiple previous transactions. Hence, transactions should be able to move a lot of digital money. Each transaction is said to have inputs and outputs where the inputs can be one or more and the outputs are two, one to the intended receiver and one to the sender's own address so they can collect the remainder of the digital money they didn't send to the receiver. If it wasn't already apparent, there isn't a notion of accounts in Nakamoto's payment system vision. Instead, the balance of a user, say Bob, is constructed by getting the sum of all the unclaimed transactions that have been sent to Bob. So, Nakamoto admits that there may be a concern regarding privacy thanks to the fact that all transactions are publicly announced. He argues, though, that this should be okay given that the virtual addresses used in transactions are anonymous and don't link to any real-world identity. Despite that, someone can still observe how an address moves money, which could in turn suggest something about the identity behind an address. To that point, Nakamoto explains that nodes can use multiple different addresses. In fact, he advises that nodes use a new address for each transaction. Nakamoto lays out some calculations that provide guarantees surrounding the odds of a double spend attack happening in his electronic payment system. Take two chains, the Honest Chain, which is the chain where the attacker recently spent some funds to buy a good, and a dishonest chain, which is a chain where the attacker wishes to reverse the funds they just sent. 
the chances of a double spin happening comes down to a race between those two chains. To understand the race, Nakamoto lays out a couple important parameters. Q is the probability that the attacker finds the next block. And that, as we talked about earlier, is tied to CPU power. P is the probability that the honest node finds the next block. Finally, Z is the number of blocks the attacker chain is behind the honest chain. Say Q is 10%, Nakamoto proves that Z only needs to be 5 for the network to be sufficiently certain that the attacker won't catch up. Put in other terms, if the attacker chain is behind by 5 blocks and the attacker only controls 10% of the network CPU power, then we can be very certain, in fact with probability less than 0.1%, that the attacker will catch up, right? So with probability less than 0.1%, the attacker will catch up given these circumstances. That's pretty low, right? I think we can all agree on that. However, as Q, the percentage that the attacker will find the next block, gets closer to 50%, Z needs to be much higher, as much as 340 blocks in the case that Q is 45%. The main takeaway is that the payment network is secure, assuming the honest nodes control more than the majority of the network. The electricity cost of trying to extend an attacker chain is too high to gamble on low probabilities. In conclusion, Nakamoto has proposed an electronic payment system, known as Bitcoin, that doesn't need to rely on trusting centralized third parties. Instead, independent network participants validate publicized transactions in order to reach a single history. So that's all we have for you today. In our next episode, we'll be doing a guided reading of Vitalik Buterin's 2013 white paper, Ethereum, a next generation smart contract and decentralized application platform. See you next time.